My name is Sarah Donovan, and I am in Stillwater, Oklahoma. Today is October 7th, 2020, and I am interviewing Stacy Joy of Inglewood, California, for the oral history project titled COVID-19 Teacher Poets Writing to Bridge the Distance. This will be archived by Oklahoma State University's Oral History Research Program. So Stacy, I wonder if you'll just begin by introducing yourself. Sure. So my name is Stacy Joy, and I have two children, uh, well, two adult children, a son and a daughter, 32 and 29. And I am a sister of my best friend, which is wonderful. And I am living life without both of my parents. And I think that's been the real challenge that I've had to take on as an adult is wearing big girl pants and just handling life without those two people in your life that always take care of you. So that's a little piece of the personal part of me. And um, I'm a teacher, fifth grade teacher <laughs> at Baldwin Hills Gifted Magnet in Los Angeles. And I've been teaching for 35 years and I love it. I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about how you became a teacher, um, including sort of your training and your education and your specialty. Sure. Uh, so I graduated from UCLA. Uh, oh, I heard an echo. Is everything okay? Okay. I graduated from UCLA and I didn't really intend at that time to go into teaching uh, elementary school. I thought I would be a secondary teacher. So I actually had been observing in secondary classrooms and getting like my kind of my feet wet with secondary education. And then when it was time to go to be hired with the school district, they were like, oh, we're going to put you in elementary. And I was like, ah. <laughs> so um, yeah, right out of college into elementary teaching. And it was, uh, I will say that it was definitely part of my life's plan. And it was a calling because when I was five, I started playing school and teaching my dolls in my bedroom. And my mother was a teacher and she'd bring me her keys and her grade books and chalk and boards and everything. So I pretty much started training, I think at five. But to say at 21 years old, I'm ready to take on third grade, it was very scary. Like the parents were older than I was and they're looking at me like, you're my child's teacher. <laughs> so. And then I just found my, my little happy space with lower grades, third and fourth grade. And then I kind of moved up to fifth and sixth grade as the years went on. And now I've just stayed with fourth and fifth. I'm national board certified as well. And um, I was a LA County Teacher of the Year in 2012. Wow. Tell us about that. Um, how were, you know, how did you become or how did, were you nominated? As right. That was so crazy. So it was um, by nomination first from your school for a district position as teach, uh, district teacher of the year. And I didn't know. I just thought that that was like, oh, you know, another special accolade. I never had heard about it, didn't think much about it, but I pursued it and said, sure, I'll continue with the process. So after the district teacher of the year, they offer you an opportunity to can to continue and that gave me an option to go into LA County Teacher of the Year and the odds of that are like so like you can just forget it and so I just I don't know I've always been one of those kind of people that's like well whatever you know if I have the energy and it feels right I'll just do it so when it came down to the very end and I was one of the 16 I found out that one of the 16 and the only African American and out of 77,000 people like I, I that part i just i still can't even really sit with that and believe it but that was the best like process and experience of like probably of my career aside from national boards because that that changes you as a teacher but that accolade as teacher of the year was something i yeah it was amazing well congratulations thank you <laughs> um can, this might be a little bit difficult to answer, but can you tell me why you won? What was it that they were telling you or what was it being surrounded? Um, you know, 
there was there were so many facets of the process that like one of the facets was the connections that we make with students and families and community and that i feel like has always been one of my strengths because i teach in the community where i grew up and just knowing like my own mother was a teacher of the same community so even some of my students parents knew my mother and like went to the school where she taught so I had this connection with them that I feel like is part of something that sets you apart from the, the rest. And then in addition to that, the innovative ways that I would come up with um, projects and activities for my students and just not sticking with the same old thing and always kind of stepping out a little bit and taking chances. I think that was part of it. <laughs> Wow, thank you so much for sharing more about that. I think that is going to come into our conversation here today, where we're thinking about the impact of COVID-19 pandemic and other pandemics, Black Lives Matter, um, protests that have been in our news this year, specifically in the spring of 2020, um, which is why we're here doing oral history, because the these this unrest in our country coincided with National Poetry Month, where a group of educators came together, were doing writing a poem a day during this time. So I wonder if you can take us into the moment that you recall uh, learning about COVID-19's impact, that what that would have on your own classroom practice. Um, so the day that we were told that we wouldn't be returning, um, it just so happened that that was also the week of parent conferences for um, the students to get report cards. And so we had our our one on one sessions with parents. And I remember having those conversations the last two days of that week where parents are saying, so we're really not coming back like we're, we're not going to be gone just for a couple of days. This, this might be a couple of weeks. And we're like, yes, this will be, you know, at least two weeks. And just you know prepare your student to be able to know that i'm still going to provide instruction and we'll carry on and i think it was a little bit like in my mind i said this is just like a little miniature vacation <laughs> even though we're still teaching and still learning just kind of you need a little break and like if it just so happens it was also maybe two three weeks away from spring break so we're already worn out like you're you're just like, oh, the time off. So there were these conflicting feelings of, I'm gonna get time off, but then I'm not really off. And then the students aren't getting what they need. And is this gonna work? You know, it was just, it was so hard to just grapple with it all and say, it'll be fine. But, but I really wasn't panicking because I was more looking forward to that break. <laughs> Even if it just meant I'm on, you know, doing lessons online, but I don't have to get up and go anywhere. Mm -hmm. And I don't have to get dressed. I just, that's how I thought in the beginning. And during that time we started writing, um, some teachers were starting to write poetry. Um, how did the uh, writing poetry fit into your, your time off? Was that part of your relaxing or was that part of um, something that you normally do? Where does that fit in? I think, because everything was so different and new and and like who's been here before i was so appreciative of the fact that we were having our monthly poetry writing and then we would soon launch into april for poetry month and it was almost like thank god there's a relief in the day even if it's you know the first hour of the morning where i could read other people's poems and then engage with them and then spend some time on my own writing later, whatever it was, it was almost like there was that little thing on your shoulder saying, but you've got your poems to write today, or you've got some poems to read today. And that's like a little bit of a piece that you just know is there. So that, that helped. I wonder if you will um, share one of the poems from that to help okay. us um, see what that felt like for you. Okay, um, I think I'll share with you first, um the golden shovel poem which we um i think we did that on day 10 of our our month-long writing 
And the Golden Shovel poem is one of my favorites because number one, I love Nikki Grimes and I know that she has an entire book of Golden Shovel poems. And, <clears throat> and this particular prompt asked us to find something that we wanted to use and then that becomes the, the outline of our poem. So without going into the whole formula of it all, I'll share first what the full text was that I pulled from and then the poem that I got from that. So the text that I pulled was, before putting forth blame, acknowledge that abuse doesn't always come from an outside source. Sometimes we abuse ourselves mentally, emotionally, physically, spiritually. Free yourself. Okay, so that was my mentor text, my starting point. And my poem was, what was life like before this pandemic? Thought putting for putting us in isolation might bring forth kindness? Are we to blame? Can we acknowledge or consider that hatred and collective abuse would have consequences? God doesn't like ugly. People always say, but what may come from our solitude and shelter is an embracing and gratitude of the beauty outside, an unquenchable desire to discover our source of peace and love. Sometimes we need silence and stillness. We abuse ourselves. I'm sorry, I did this last time. We abuse others beyond repair but we abuse ourselves to God's despair. Go inward and examine yourself mentally. Give your mind and soul an emotionally uplifting message. Sing, dance, and find a physically healing and strengthening practice. Rest assured, spiritually, you are covered in God's grace and mercy. Use your isolation to free yourself. What a beautiful message throughout the poem of, of self-care and, and making the most of this time. And this is pretty early in, in April where you wrote this poem. Right. I can imagine, and I rec actually recall reading this um, well during April and feeling just such hope and sense of purpose instead of wishing that things would be over but taking this time to um, reflect on the isolation and the kind of feelings that were happening right what stands out for you now is your reading this again i think in the beginning uh, well in april it felt like there was still so much angst around being outside and um, just the everyday connections with people had been completely cut off. You know, we weren't even attempting to socially distance because we were literally just inside. And I remember feeling like there's so little that I can control and it's doing me no good at all to be in a state of panic and stress and worry when this is bigger than me. Like, even if I'm worried, that's not fixing it. So because it was feeling so overwhelmingly like let your, let your trust be somewhere else other than in what you can do. Trust that the world around us has always functioned and operated without your hands in it. And so relax, release, relax and let go. And I think this was the poem when I started to see that it was really abusing me to carry around all of that angst and stress and worry. Yeah. COVID-19 had um, impacted 
states and schools in uh, lots of different ways, and um, in part because of governance, in part because of um, the location of the school. So I wonder if you can talk a little bit about how your state responded, um, how your school responded, and maybe just a little bit how that impacted your teaching. So kind of take us into sort of that next phase where you realize this was going to go on for a while. So I believe in the, in the spring, um, and, and, and it's funny because when I think about California, I remember feeling like, yes, we're doing the right thing. Like I knew that we weren't going to take a chance and go back too soon. I knew that the students were going to feel safe, that teachers would not be asked to do anything that would put us at risk. Um, I did feel that, especially with our school district being the second largest in the country, that we responded very well as far as taking care of one another. Um, I know that we serve food every day and families could come and they, the whole car load could get the food they needed. And that in itself is just like, huh, you know, thank goodness. Um, and then knowing that my, my own school site, like I thought my principal is a hardworking person and I know that this is hard for her. I'm, I'm worrying that they're going to try to like have people still come and, you know, it's like, no, everyone just says no. You cannot come. You don't need to be here. Whatever you're doing to help out, it's best if you do it in a safe way. And literally, we felt supported by doing the best work that we could online with our students every day. And there was no expectation at that time, um, as far as minutes were concerned, asynchronous versus synchronous time. So we could pretty much plan for ourselves how to make it work. And I didn't feel like there was anything being shoved down my throat, like make sure you have this number of minutes of this and this number of minutes. It was just make sure you're there, make sure you're providing instruction and the students are still learning. And they were held accountable to being there and, and participating, but we also were able to tell them you're not gonna be penalized if you're not there or if you're not participating. So it was a very interesting period of grace. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, some teachers had a harder time than others transferring their work on, online. Mm -hmm. How was that process for you and how are you um, prepared or preparing to do that work? So um, call it divine intervention, but a year ago in the summer, I said, I think I want to be a Google certified educator. <laughs> and, you know, I just was, had been following a particular uh, podcast that talked about the benefits of it all. And I've started looking at training videos and I just said, ah, go for it. I love technology. I'm not intimidated. Give it a, give it a shot. So I went for Google, Google certified educator levels one and two in the summer of 2019. So in the, this, this pandemic and having to transfer from online and in person, it was, it was seamless. Like I didn't skip a beat when it came to providing the instruction because I had already been doing it. So I didn't introduce anything new once we went into school closures. They still accessed Google Classroom. They still accessed Edmodo. Any of the, the platforms and apps we use, they had complete understanding of already. So for me, that was like, whew. but then when I'm hearing from other people, I have no idea how to use Google Classroom. I have no idea how to post assignments. It's like now we all have to kind of put in and help one another. And, and that's what we did. I mean, our school, speaking only for my school, we made sure that anyone who felt insecure about the technology skills or needed an extra push or even do I need to help you set something up we did that that was helpful can you talk a little bit more about your school and sort of the um, the the mission of the school or the way that your school is organized in a way that um that that offered this sort of support because it's not consistent with sort of what, what was um, happening across the country. Mm -hmm. So our school is a pilot school. So 
um, about six years ago, we all as a staff agreed that we wanted to change the focus of our school. And we didn't like that we have predominantly students of color who are not necessarily being given the opportunities to succeed with the curriculum that the district was pumping down their throats. So we all agreed that we would put in the work to write a pilot and center our school around culturally responsive and sustaining pedagogy, um, science, technology, engineering, arts, and math, and then project and problem-based learning. And then also infusing weekly professional learning communities, weekly collabor collaboration time, lots of um, enrichment for students. They get yoga, they get engineering, they get, um, what's our other one? Um, chess and it's like everything just kind of came together to create the best case scenario for students who are in our community and then when it came time for something like we're on school closures how do we provide and continue they've already felt the love and the connection and and they know that their teachers are there for them we don't have to worry about teacher a is providing the curriculum but teacher b is not because in a pilot school, if you're not providing the curriculum that you've signed and agreed to provide, then you're not asked to return. So there, everyone in the school has bought in and the families and the community understands what we're about. So I think that that alone, because it was the foundation of who we are, it created a perfect space for how to handle the trauma of something we've never experienced. And we, and we definitely layer a lot of what we do, too, in trauma-informed instruction and providing supports for students. Thank you. Mm -hmm. During this time of the COVID pandemic, um, we also um, experienced um, protests um, racially, um, you know, a, a sort of a, a movement mm -hmm to have greater racial equality in our country and social justice at the same time that this was happening with COVID-19. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how that impacted your community and if you have any, write, if you did any writing through that as well. Okay. There were, it, it's, it's like I, I had to think about it because I remember on May 25th, it just so happens that's also my son's birthday, but that was the day for, um, George Floyd was killed. And I remember because it was so close to the end of the school year and like you're wrapping it up and, you know, tying up loose ends and like your end of the year relaxed and those kinds of things. But because we were in the pandemic and we were working from home and school and not at school, it almost felt like the students were checking out because they know that like this is this is a bad time like now is now if any time did we have to really pull into them and like make sure that they were okay so um increasing our screen time to have a little more face to face making sure that we have a, a zoom to to just check in and do those quick emotional wellness checks and community circle. Um, we do that anyway every day, but it was even more important at that time to check in. And we were, we were pleased overall with the fact that most of our families and students, well aware, you know, there, there's not, I, I wouldn't say there would be very many students who are kind of kept you know, away from it all. You know, sometimes parents think they don't need to learn that they're too young, it's too much they needed to know and they knew it. they knew it and they were there they were present they, there were some students that said they went out on the protests with their families and you know los angeles had a lot going on so you know they were seeing the riots and the people breaking into the stores and we had conversations about all that and and it's a good thing when you know that you can have honest conversations with students and not worry that they're too young or too this or that because we we gave that that space for them and and they shared and they were safe did these topics um 
of the intersections of the pandemics um, make it into any of your writing over this time? I think that um, there was one there was one prompt that I thought, wow, it's funny that this is co this is completely re relating to injustices today when it was a picture that was a prompt of something long ago. So they showed um, whoever gave us the prompt gave us different photographs and said, pick the photograph that speaks to you and write to that. So the photograph that I selected was about seven or eight little black kids playing around a little wagon. And they may have been like ages four to seven or eight. And just the sweetest, most innocent little faces you could ever imagine. And you just know though that in that photo, there's so much injustice around them from the time period that the picture happened. But then you translate that to today and it's the exact same. It's like, here we are again. So the poem that I wrote was called, They Haven't Yet. And it's um, written in black language. So I'll say it the way that I think it should sound. They haven't yet. They haven't yet heard their mama's wailing. When their daddy's got caged, no chance for bailing. Don't understand, ain't nothing wrong. But skin too black and mind too strong. They haven't yet, haven't yet gone to the Negro schools where white folks be calling them nasty fools. Young church ladies try their hands at teaching on Sunday evening after pastors done preaching. They haven't yet been beaten and kicked in the streets, but they seen hatred riding behind white sheets. White men breeding their power and hate in a country where nothing ain't never been great. They haven't yet stood in line to vote. Rights and equality ain't even been wrote. Their own children haven't yet been born in a nation where they'll forever be scorned. They haven't yet died while trying to live. They had only one smile and laugh to give. They had only one hand and hope to hold. They had only each other to love and behold. Thanks for that. I move, I move deeply by your poem. I wonder if there's a line or a phrase or as you're rereading it, how it's making you feel or, or what, what you're thinking about. Right now, they haven't yet stood in line to vote. We vote in a matter of weeks to change the country that we're living in right now. And the fact that there are so many injustices around voting and around just the choices that people can make to make change happen. We, we don't get to just walk into a, a polling place and turn in our ballot. Not anymore. We, we can't even be sure that when we place our ballot in the mailbox, it'll be counted. And this reminds me so much of in the days when Black people had to count, guess how many marbles are in the jar in order to be registered to vote. Well, you may as well bring all that right back because that's what's happening now. And it's disgusting. It, it makes me angry, but I could sob. Where these poems were published was on a public site um, with you know, close to 100 different teachers, educators on the blog, writing, reading, responding. I wonder if you recall any responses to your poem or, or if you can talk a little bit about how you felt writing this and putting it into this, uh, into this space. There have been several times where I've written and, and I'm, I'm hoping that other writers do this too. And you look at your writing and you go, yeah. And then you're like, well, I'll go ahead and submit. 
And there, there's just been those days where I, I'm shocked that something that I felt eh, about is getting like, you nailed it. Uh, this one hits you in the gut and just brings out the raw emotion. Or Stacy, I'm crying with you here. I love you. And I'm with, I mean, just the mixture of connections and validations and affirmations for who we are as writers and who we are as humans and who I am as a black woman. You know, I don't want to ever look at my own writing as it's, I don't even know how to put it. Like when I look at my own writing, I see my writing. I, I'm, I, it's just, you know, I, I don't even know that I'm putting power on the page. I'm sometimes I'm just putting it out there. Sometimes it's not even revised. It's like, get it out there. So to hear from any one of these respected, amazing educators and writers, to hear them say this is powerful or here you go again, you've nailed it. It's just, it, it reminds me to continue to say, I am a writer. Yeah, I think where you are and your voice has, um, has not only inspired us and pushed our thinking and, um, and for pers me personally, um, also to continue to write and continue to take risks and to continue to even be vulnerable in that space. Uh, but also your, your listening in that space as well has also been a great comfort to teachers from across the country as well who share that space with you. And we're sort of bearing witness to one another's lives through the poetry that we you know, can't sit alongside each other right now. So I'm wondering about how your school year sort of wrapped up and how you were able to sort of navigate these really strong feelings that you were having about what's happening in our country, what's happening in your school, and also um, maintain that sense of um, support in your class, classrooms in school. I think I was very much uh, resolved with the school year is over. Um, it, it almost felt like it was over March 13th, you know, the day that we said goodbye. And I was resolved that it was over in a way that I couldn't, I couldn't sit with and I couldn't accept. I was frustrated because I didn't pack up my classroom the way that I normally do. I was upset because at the end of the year, every year for 35 years, we have a party and we hug and we cry and, you know, we celebrate because this class I was keeping for the next year. So it was like, you know, I knew that we'd pack up and have fun together and know where do you want to put things so that when we come back in August, you'll know exactly where it is. It just, it was the worst ending in, in a way that I couldn't even really I, I, I just, I had anxiety about the end because I, I just kept thinking that maybe we'll be back in August and it'll all feel okay again because it felt so wrong. I had to end with virtual ceremonies and, you know, giving awards to students via Zoom <laughs> and, you know, not even trusting putting it in the mail because a lot of times you don't even really have the correct addresses. So it's like, let's just celebrate online. You know, we'll watch a movie together, share the screen, have popcorn, whatever, enjoy each other, and then say goodbye. And I remember recording one farewell, I, I'm, I'm proud of you kind of videos. And I felt like it felt so strange. Like, I was outside in fresh air and I'm saying, you know, I love you all and you did so well and blah, blah, blah. And I think I really just wanted to say, this is so horrible, you know? And, you know, it was just like, I had a rage about the way that this had to be, but then I just was like, it's okay. And I'm gonna continue to push through and we're going to be fine. And when I realized we weren't coming back in August, I said, see, <laughs> that's why you need to stop acting like you can control anything because you're right back at it and you're going to be spending even more time online. So get ready. I don't even know if I answered your question. Yeah, yes. I mean, you know, I, I was interested in hearing how it sort of wrapped up, you know, not knowing that 
you know, essentially the school year was over, but the, but, but the, but nothing was back to normal. Like it didn't, right. it didn't end by going back into the schools. It ended with your virtual award ceremony. Mm -hmm. Should be here. What that look like for you? And um, you know, I think you have a poem of sort of the last day of the um, month of April, the open open right for April poetry. Would would that now be a good time to share that one? I believe it would. It's one of my um, more heartfelt passion pieces because, um, and I'm sure that anyone who has been writing and doing uh, teaching writing of poetry to students where I'm from poems always are just a hit um, from, and I have to say this because it just shocks me every time I say this, I'll say 10 years back. It's probably more, but I'm just going to go with 10 writing where I'm from poems with my students and always saving my work because I like to, you know, go back. But one year I, sh I saved a student's work and shared it with a class. And I, I, it reminded me again of the value of letting students know that they're really good writers and that their writing is going to go somewhere one day. Because some of these students whose writing I've shared over the years, they're 30 years old, but I'm still sharing their 10 year old writer writing. If only they knew, you know, that you as a 10 year old, your writing is going to be the mentor text for somebody 10, 15 years later. Mm -hmm. So where I'm from poems just hold me dear in my heart. All right. So mine is from 2020, April the 30th, I think. Okay. Yes. <laughs> I'm from put your hands on your hips and let your backbone slip from my mother's strong legs and thick thighs to wide smiles and dark brown eyes. I'm from four generations of freckles and moles to stop combing your hair so much and maybe it'll grow. I'm from Gloria and Jay, both graduates of UCLA. I'm from playing school and wanting to teach to walking on the sink to get things out of my reach. I'm from, are you my mother to are you there, God? It's me, Margaret. I'm from creating a hidden reading room in a linen closet to card table tents and Barbie campers. I'm from a big yellow house on a hill in the Dons to pool parties and slip and slide scratches, scratched knees. From backyard baby showers and Christmas brunches to classy bridge players and domino dads talking trash. I'm from hopscotch and laggers on the side of the house to a daring first kiss that made me shiver and spit. I'm from Nestle Quicks chocolate bubbles floating in my milk to go-go burgers and Tito's tacos with guacamole. From burnt cheese toast and El Patio Mexican restaurant to sardines and crackers after Saturday morning waffles. I'm from Nana's Monday night Russian bank in Pocino to mommy's badminton matches on Sunday mornings in the gym. I'm from drive safely and don't stay out too late to cheerleading at Friday night football games and shakies after. From you will not be driving for two more weeks to senior prom and graduation past curfew, graduation parties past curfew. I'm from mommy, I think I'm pregnant, to sedation at a clinic plagued with regrets. I'm from growing up and moving out to dorms, apartments, and owning a, my condo. From married with two children and too many jobs too young to divorced, grateful, and balanced. I'm from the suffering of my mother's and father's cancer to the resurrection of hope and joy after grief. I'm from struggle, suffering, injustice, and equalities to taking a stand, sitting in, and marching onward. 
I'm from knowing my ancestors had it harder than us to trusting that God is still the same today and always. I'm from poetry, chalk, protests, and music. I'm from breath and spirit. I'm from love. Thank you so much, Stevie. I wonder if we can um, talk a little bit about, before we finish, if we can talk a little bit about what's next. So we have where you're from and where are we going? You know, in this, um, I don't know, eight months or so, what have you sort of learned or discovered about education? Maybe that you already knew, but it's even deeper. And what, what would you like to see change? Ooh, that's loaded. Well, I think we're going in a direction of complete change. I refuse to believe that there will ever be a return to normal because normal was not normal for people of color. Normal was not normal for students with disabilities. Normal was not normal for the majority of people. It was only normal for people in power. So we're shifting and we're moving towards a, a, a world and, a, and an education system that could possibly provide an equality and an equitable education for everyone. It could possibly be the kind of education that makes the changes happen within children's hearts that, make the, that makes them love learning. Imagining that we could have Students come to school every day and excited to be there, whether it be online or in person, but they're there because they know they're loved. I mean, the idea of nurturing the gift in every child and bringing the best out in every human being and, and believing that one way is not the only way. If we can do that, I think that we'll see the shift that maybe this is what the pandemic was all about in the first place. And maybe then the injustices and the racial inequalities and all of the problems and the systemic issues will start to change. I know it's not gonna happen overnight, but I think if we start with education and we see that we're insistent on making it better and not allowing powers that be to dictate what's right and what's wrong, I think that we'll see a better future for everyone, teachers and students, and of course, then the families. Thank you. Well, we've been talking for a while now, and I wonder if there's anything else you sort of want to say for the record or have on record, or if you have one more poem that you would want to share as we um, say our goodbyes for now. Yes, I do have one more, and it's the day 30 poem. So I think I may have done the reverse, but it's okay. My day 30 poem, um, because it's about writing and I feel that there's a beautiful feeling that comes from writing and knowing that writing can become a haven, a safe space. So if I can help my students to feel that and I can bring that to other people, then I believe that's part of the change and the healing that will happen. So my final poem is Free Writing, and, and that's the title, Free Writing. Writing without restraints, the freedom to go with my own ebb and flow, knowing my words will land in the safe spaces of your hands. Fearless and bold, you say I am, but I still hide and seek myself my story, writing with you, unleashes more of me, showing me how to be proud, unafraid to reveal a few cracks, some big gaping holes that I gently fill one poem at a time. Grateful for my struggles, my obstacles and issues, my blessings and joy. They strengthen and sharpen me Grateful for poetry and poets and you, 
This is where floating rainbow hearts ascend to the ceiling.